we've got a healthy uh, group in here. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with my introductions. Uh, hello, and welcome to a look inside Palestinian and Israeli classrooms. Um, this is an event hosted by author and activist Miko Peled. Uh, I'm Jamil, and I help Miko out with webinars and campaigns, and I'll be opening up this talk and facilitating the Q&A section. So uh, thanks to the audience, uh, both returning people and new folks alike. We are live streaming this event to Miko's Facebook page. So if you wanna share this event with people who did not register, or you just wanna get someone in right away, you can let them know to go to facebook.com slash Miko Pelled official, and they'll be able to watch the live stream from there. Uh, we also make each of our webinars available to rewatch, along with further reading and citations from the panel at mikopelled.com. You can also register for Miko's email list there too, and that's really the best way to stay up to date on these webinars and any other events that we're planning. So we are very fortunate today to have uh, three wonderful guests for the panel. These are some of the foremost scholars, educators, and activists who have you know, committed their efforts and even their careers into the world of education, particularly as it relates to Palestine and Israel. And I'm gonna take the opportunity to introduce you to them all. So we have, first off, uh, Dr. Ilham Nasser, a PhD, former senior advisory to the Ministry of Education in Palestine a senior researcher at Advancing Education in Muslim Societies Initiative and um, the International Institute of Islamic Thought. We have Dr. Uh, Cassandra Nubi Alexander, who is Dean of the College of Liberal Arts at Norfolk University, Professor of History and Director of the Joseph Jenkins Roberts Center for African Diaspora Studies. And lastly, we have Dr. Nuri Peled Al-Hanan, uh, professor of Language and Education at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, uh, the Sakharov Prize Laureate for Human Rights awarded by the European Parliament, uh, co-initiator with Palestinian uh, Embassy in the EU of the Russell Tribunal on Palestine. Um, so a very, very decorated panel we have here, um, and thank you all for joining us. So um, before I hand things over to Miko, just a little context. Um, so after we released our, our two-part webinar, What Do They Teach Our Children? Israel's Intervention in American Social Studies Curriculum, we got a, a huge amount of interest and in emails and follow-up um, from people on the subject of how Palestine and Israel, um, maybe as well as broader Arab and Muslim framings, like intersect with primary and secondary education, basically K through 12 curriculum. And we wanted to investigate this phenomenon beyond just what happens here in the US and get into Palestinian and Israeli classrooms. Um, so we wanted to expand this webinar series in order to examine the direction and the substance of school curriculum we find in modern Israeli and Palestinian uh, K through 12 environment while contrasting them with what we know about, you know, the very lopsided US curriculum. And, and then we know about, now we know about some of, the, some of those influences and interventions. So that's, you know, broadly what we're going to be speaking about today. Um, and I think we're all really excited to hear the panelists insights and research. Um, in terms of housekeeping for the event, there is a chat room. So feel free to chat amongst each, chat amongst each other or there. Um, I'll be trying to cite any of the resources that the panelists um, are, are, are uh, you know, citing throughout their presentations. And um, we'll also do a follow up email which collects all of those citations with links that, so you can do some further uh, reading and investigating on your own. Um, after the panel discussion, we will uh, get into a Q&A. So um, at any point in the, in the event, if you have a, a, something you'd like one of the panelists to answer or all of the panel to answer, then uh, feel free to use that Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom bar and I'll collect those. And I think that should do it for housekeeping. I'm going to pass it over to Miko to get the event started. Okay, thanks, Jamil. And thank you, everybody, for participating. Um, for the panelists, if you don't mind, we'll make it casual. I'll just call you by your first names. And so thank you, Cassandra, Ilham, and uh, Nurit. I'll make a disclaimer. Nurit is my sister. 
Um, and so the fact that we share a last name is not a coincidence. And um, it's great to have, uh, you know, the level of expertise that the three, three of you bring to the table uh, to discuss this issue. Like Jamil uh, said earlier, we, this is the third of, um, of a th kind of a three chapter uh, series, if you will, about the issue of education and the intervention in education and racism in education and, and what is actually taking place in the classroom which is something that I think most people kind of take for granted uh, that our kids are being taught in public schools, what we want them to be taught or what we're told they're being taught, uh, which is fair and balanced and perhaps, uh, you know, uh, not too politically slanted one way or the other. The, the first two uh, sessions that we had, the question was, what are they teaching our children? And that really was the, uh, that was kind of the topic. That was the subject of these two panels. And what we learned was really pretty shocking, I have to say, especially in America where people are still arguing whether children should be taught creationism or evolution, for example, to find out that on the, the issue of Palestine, the issue of the Middle East, the issue of Israel, um, that region, the things that are taught are either biblical, which of course is not history, um, and that the influence of the pro-Israeli groups, some of the Zionist groups in America, um, on the actual curriculum in the social studies, uh, the social studies curriculum, is 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 vast, and 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 um, they reach into the classrooms, and they make sure that their perspective is uh, is shown, their perspective is taught, and there's always a pro-Israeli a pro-Israeli slant and an anti-Arab, anti-Muslim, anti-Palestinian slant. Um, and this is happening in every state. There's a lot of work being done by these groups, pro-Israeli groups in every state. Um, and thankfully in Virginia, there's a Virginia Coalition of Human Rights. In Texas, there's a Texas Coalition of Human Rights. And they've been engaging um, with the education systems in these uh, states in order to push back, which is very, very good. But really, I, I have to say, even I was shocked to see just how deep the intervention is. Um, and um, today we're going to take a, a slightly different look with three with the three of you um, using your expertise, um, and um, we're going to start with Cassandra. And your perspective is um, more of what happens here in the United States, and 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 like what you call the, the master narrative is how it's being taught in regards to the issue of civil rights and 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 the the. the uh, the treatment of African Americans and so forth. So I won't speak for you, but uh, please go ahead. Well, thank you so much. And, and I very much appreciate being a part of this incredible panel. Um, in 2019, I led an executive team from Norfolk State University's Center for African American Public Policy to actually meet with the governor of Virginia. For those of you who may know, our governor got into a little bit of trouble with the blackface picture. And so that, we wanted to use that to open the door to start having a conversation about issues involving race because so much of this was deeply embedded into the, not just the psychological narrative, of America, but but the way in which we teach and approach history, education, and so forth. And so we he opened the door for us to meet with him and his entire executive team for the entire day. And so we met with, um, at one point we met with the Secretary of Education to also talk about how can the Commonwealth transform the state from its long-standing racial inequities, especially with regards to how the standards of learning are politicized so much that really it's the traditional white male format that's presented. And that actually makes history difficult to understand. And we've also um, had the ability to meet with a number of young people um, of all different races and nationalities who have echoed the same sentiment. Well, after our meeting, the governor uh, really took our recommendation seriously and he created a commission on African-American history education and asked me to be one of the two co-chairs for that particular commission. 
And the commission is made up of people from all over the Commonwealth who are scholars, who are educators, uh, who are in the schools, both public and private, in some capacity, um, to really make recommendations about how we can bring this very rich history of uh, Virginia to the forefront and the rich history in America to the forefront that really was impeded by all these uh, kind of political agendas that were a part of that particular, or our standards of learning. And to give you an example, um, the commission noted that uh, there's a framework that even belies definitions of certain terms. So America, in American history, the Americans and the Americans are usually referencing only those immigrants from England, the Americans expanded across the nation, completely ignoring the fact that there were nation states that existed on this land that they simply expanded uh, through. Um, there's this idea that America stands for freedom and justice and so forth, and our American history is littered with examples that that was the last thing America stood for. And so we said that first and foremost, there are 10 key concepts that will help to ensure that, um, that we teach the fuller history and that we stop segregating African American history from US history in general. And some of those concepts, those 10 key concepts include freedom, imperialism slash nationalism, colonialism, racism, and specifically the definition of systematic racism. Another key point, capitalism or economic motivation, citizenship, servitude, and enslavement. And they were, of course, two very different things. Advocacy and agency, cultural expressionism, and finally, invasion slash colonization. Now it's clear that teaching requires identifying and then deconstructing a set of fundamental misunderstandings or misdefinitions about whatever topic you're about to discuss. And I wanna give you uh, an example of one. And this was written by Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries, who is an associate professor of, of African American history at Ohio State University. He's also the author of a 2009 book called Bloody Lounds, Civil Rights and Black Power in Alabama's Black Belt. This was published by New York University Press. He's also the producer of a podcast called Teaching Hard History where he observed that you must begin by identifying and then deconstructing whatever the master narrative is. And so what Jeffries did was he observed that it's important to portray things as they actually happen while illuminating the distortions created by the master narrative so that people have a comparison and contrast in order to understand what they've been told is the history versus what is actually the history. Now, to give an example, in the case of the master narrative of the civil rights movement, the, according to the master narrative, the civil rights movement didn't begin until the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954, and then continued through an interracial alliance led by Dr. Martin Luther King and a courtier of a handful of black male ministers, um, who then received unwavering support, not only from an inter interracial alliance, but from US presidents, John F. Kennedy and Lyndon B. Johnson. And according to this master narrative, these presidents put the full weight of the government and its agencies to fight discrimination and white violence against especially blacks in the South. The master narrative continues by blaming blacks for not being satisfied with their progress. And as a result, we would see this black power movement, which was an incendiary violent movement that sought to destroy American society and culture. And that, of course, despite the acknowledgement by Southern whites that discrimination against blacks was wrong and the elimination of all discrimination occurred, of course, the master narrative supporting that, the reality was very different. 
Now, this master narrative rests on a series of, of set false assumptions that make the actual movement almost unrecognizable to reality, locating the activism, first of all, to a specific period, as if only in the 1950s and 60s we would have this activism. These misconceptions would mask the civil rights movement's most fundamental characteristics as a diverse movement with numerous constituents, goals, and tactics. Instead, of course, the master narrative describes it as a monolithic singular movement. And of course, the master narrative substitutes the fictions that reduces racial discrimination to personal prejudice. It limits civil rights leaderships, as I said to Dr. King and his and a small group of ministers, and it distorts the movement from a larger black freedom struggle that began as early as 1619 and continues even to until today. It also ignores embedded cultural injustices and racial bias. And instead, the master narrative creates the myth of perpetual racial progress that was localized to an exact place, i.e. the South, a precise time period and type of protest, marches and sit-ins, a shorter time period, 1954 to 1965, and a specific group of activists. And what Jeffries does is he's just, he suggests that the way in which the civil rights movement should be framed includes positioning it so that we understand several key components. One, that there was a continuum of black protest. Two, that black protests extended beyond the South. Three, that the protests did not just involve Dr. Martin Luther King, so moving it away from a King-centric approach. Four, that the movement was about pursuing freedom rights, not just civil rights. Five, that the movement was more than simply a nonviolent crusade. Six, that mobilizing and organizing was first and foremost at the grassroots level. Seven, that, that the movement was not a blame game, that instead the movement was looking holistically at what was happening, why was it happening, what were the reactions to what was going on, and how people were trying to move forward. Next, the multiple approaches to how things changed, not just, okay, so these presidents pat, pushed to pass certain legislation, Congress passed those legislations, and of course, zippity doo dah, everything is wonderful and great. And then finally, measuring victory and defining defeat and really looking at where we are today. Because of course, the protest movements of today are showing American society and the world actually, that all these things that we said was over and done with is far from being over and done with. Now, if school systems throughout the world take an important hard step in evaluating their, their localized past, and identifying how they all have a very flawed master narrative that supports the status quo, it will begin the important process of educating our future generations about their, the national and international reality. Virginia's Commission on African American History uh, Education is in the process of helping the state move along that path. And I believe that this can be a model for uh, not just commissions, similar commissions throughout the United States, but commissions throughout the world because it can bring together scholars and educators can, that can help develop a, mod, a model curriculum that is, for the most part, devoid of any kind of political agenda that reflects a much more broader and more balanced perspective of our history. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you, Cassandra. Can I ask you, um, so this, this, this master narrative that you described so very clearly, is it, is it being challenged? Uh, in other words, how is it and how, if so, how is it being challenged both in Virginia and 
uh, in other parts of the country? Um, there are there are scholars throughout the country who have actually been challenging this master uh, narrative. Um, and those states that do not have a political lockdown on um, change, you know, on addressing and looking at racial issues, uh, those states are actually invested in changing those narratives. But you, you still have a lot of politics involved because the, the, the master narrative rests on the idea, first and foremost, that of American exceptionalism that America is America because it's so exceptional. And the reason it's so exceptional is because, you know, the basically white people from England and from other parts of Western Europe came to this country, settled it and created this incredible civilization. And while there was, you know, some, there were some problems. We had, you know, a bad chapter in American history called slavery. You know, we, we, we folded these individuals into America and used their talents and abilities to make America great. But, it's, but America is not great when they are in the driver's seat. You still have to maintain, you know, white supremacy and white male supremacy in particular to maintain that um, trajectory of greatness. And so the master narrative embeds those ideas into it and, and there's a, quite a bit of resistance to that um, uh, throughout the, the country because of the investment that so many people have in how history is being told because that gives people, some people, a sense of ownership, but it, uh, it is also a weapon to try to um, extinguish efforts to change that narrative so that it is more historically balanced. And, and the reason I brought this out is because I see this kind of issue as an issue throughout the world of any, any groups who are not part of the, who are not the power brokers. And in their effort to try to change the narrative, they face the same kinds of hurdles and situations. Yeah, I want to ask you also, I know, and again, I'm new to this, but what I've learned over the last, you know, weeks uh, doing these panels, it seems that on the issue of, uh, of you know, the Palestine-Israel issue and the way it's portrayed in, in, social, in the social studies uh, uh, classes and curriculum, it seems that the, the battleground, so to speak, is the social st science uh, conferences and the review boards, the state review boards, when they review curricula. So, is this is this the same uh, is this the same battleground that you that? Oh yeah, it's actually even worse, and that's why Virginia moved away from adopting a textbook uh, to having uh, a different format in place where they get the scholars to create a general narrative, and then they use a whole host of vetted resources uh, to help teachers. Um, and provide them with an appropriate guide because in the United States, the textbook industry is driven by what happens and the interpretations that are accepted from Texas. And right. Texas has right. a very reactionary approach to the narrative um, right. that just makes things flat out wrong. And, uh, and Virginia has had its black eyes and its broken jaws with textbooks that actually talked about how thousands of African-American men served in the Confederate army and they served with distinction and blah, blah, blah. And of course these were from bogus websites that completely fabricated history. And it was because the person who was writing, one, was not a historian, two, was connected to someone who was on the state review board. And so there, there was a, a kind of an evil coalition going on, uh, be, or collusion, I should say, going on between what the people wanted to see and what they started writing and then adopting in the textbooks. And, and so Virginia has simply moved away from those textbooks that are very politically driven. And, um, and I, I would say that the more successful models are doing that and they're adopting um, these, these writings and these other kinds of texts 
uh, sometimes a series of, of articles governed by a general narrative or a general outline. Um, but these are written by scholars so that they ignore or they, they kind of bypass the politicizing of what should be adopted. And, and they go more towards uh, what are scholars saying on this particular topic and how can educators take that information and, and break it down to their different, um, you know, their different educational levels, you know, whether it's K through three or, you know, higher. And so that seems to be a much more effective way um, that's, that's, that is taking place throughout the country in various states. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I'll move on to uh, Nurit now. I remember when um, you were working on your, your uh, now very famous book, the Palestine Israeli textbooks, uh, Israeli school books, uh, which was uh, groundbreaking and still is, I think, in, in many ways considered groundbreaking. And I remember we talked about this and one thing you said way back then was the you know, you, you were wondering how is it that Israeli kids who go to Israeli public school and learn what seems like a pretty liberal kind of education end up being able to put on a uniform and doing the things that they do once they're in uniform towards the Palestinians. And that that was kind of, if I remember correctly, what drove you, or one of the things that drove you to researching uh, the textbooks and writing the book. Um, so go ahead, please. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Yours? Oh, okay. I'm going to show you a PowerPoint and I'll speak. You're breaking up a little, I can't hear you very well. Um, your internet connection is unstable. Yeah, let's see. Wait, I'm. Okay, see that? Yeah, better. Um, you know, you broke up, you were breaking up. We can't hear you very well. Well, we can see, but we can't hear. We can't hear you. Okay. Okay, now we can hear you, but we missed your, what you were say, what you said uh, up to this point. Um, okay, now you hear me? Yeah. All right. So I'll share it again. I'm going to show you a point and I'll speak along. Uh, I'm going really to speak mostly about my, um, my study and uh, to show how school books really legitimate uh, society in Israel. Now, school books. It, uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. It doesn't move, Nico. What, Jamil? What's uh, something? There's a problem here. You should be able to advance oh, okay. the, advance the PowerPoint by pressing, by clicking yeah. or pressing the next button. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. So uh, this is a book and it was published in 2012, but I'll show you also some examples from 2013. Uh, after that, a very recent uh, study that came just now uh, shows that after 2013, uh, most books just don't mention Palestinians at all and don't mention Palestine and don't mention the, the occupation. So there's nothing to do a research on. And uh, this is what he says of Neo Ben Amos. It's not a simplistic denial claiming that this reality doesn't exist. It's more complex denial placed on the fact that education officials know the reality in the territories but are unwilling to admit it. That kind of self censorship, but really the the books do not mention Palestine or Palestinians anymore after 2013. Now, my theoretical ground for doing this research is uh, 
multidisciplinary as you see here. I'm not going to go into each and every one. It's a very multidisciplinary, super disciplinary. And the question, as Miko said before, are how are the oppressors educated? And this is a paraphrase of Fanon question, how do the oppressors behave? I hope you know who Franz Fanon is. If not, uh, we will uh, give some indications later. And this is the question that I ask myself, really. Yeah, how do nice boys and girls reach this point? Okay, reach this point. Uh, this girl who is called Woof, she was, I think, 11 years old. She took scissors and uh, she was shot in the head. And as you see, the people around are taking pictures. And you ask yourself, how come nice Jewish boys, here it's only boys, but girls too, uh, reach this point? Now, textbooks is only one, one component of education and culture. It's not everything. And upon entering Israeli schools, you immediately see slogans like, love the other, respect differences, and the other is me. Also, history curriculum, that is one of his goals, to promote understanding towards others. So all these slogans somehow are being effaced. Now, I'll speak about, a little bit about the situation in Israel. Israel is what is called ethnocracy. Although it advertises itself as a democracy, it is not, because the one ethnic group that dominates all other ethnic groups, uh, both culturally, socially, economically, and legally. Uh, Arab Israeli citizens cannot buy land wherever they want and cannot have any job they want legally. So it is not only an atmosphere of and discrimination, it is discrimination by law. And uh, Israel was never interested in teaching or in reaches, there was never any. Oh, you don't hear me? I hear you fine. Okay. Uh, there's never been any peace education, any encouragement for Jewish uh, children to, to mix or to meet uh, Arab uh, Palestinian students. And I'm talking uh, the Palestinian citizens, of Israel, not the Palestinians in the territory. Uh, since 1940, 40, there hasn't been a single so peace proposal that is not based on the of and settlement, uh, which means that um, the, the, the colonial um, law of elimination is part of, of the policies and of education. Now in Israel, uh, since there is one group that dominates everything, and it's a small group of others, all the other groups are marginalized, but we can uh, divide them into two. One is the imported Jewish and non-Arab. And by that I mean, for example, from Russia, we have about half a million who are not Jewish and were brought to Israel uh, for uh, all kinds of reasons. So, uh, be molded and cultivated to suit the deal of a Jewish Western democratic state. And therefore, they undergo some kind of symbolic cultural elimination and what is called inner colonialism. They are submitted to the state uh, for years until they are um, cultivated enough to be integrated. Some of them have been here for traditions and it's still not enough. So it's a process of a really col inner colonial um, civilization. The other group are the indigenous Arab Palestinians who are not candidates for integration in the society and never have been. They are not to be assimilated in the society and they are perceived as race, meaning a group that cannot change. They are racialized and they 
suffer from symbolic, cultural, and physical elimination. This is the difference. Uh, now, because uh, you have these, uh, these uh, others that are not supposed to, to be in the, in the center, not supposed to be among us, uh, they have to be confined somewhere. So Palestinian citizens and subjects must be distanced, for they are the foreigners in our midst, and this is a quote from a textbook. And Ethiopian Jews, for example, as Arab Jews before them in the 50s, are concentrated in camps until they can make the leap into the 20th century or the return to Judaism. They have to go forward or very much backward in order to be integrated. And as I said, good generations, they haven't done it yet. And for example, for the Ethiopians, once they leave these camps that are called centers of absorption, where there is this inner colonialism uh, ruling, um, they cannot buy a house whenever, wherever they want. There are certain places where they can buy a house. Now, a sociologist, uh, Zygmunt Bauman, who wrote a very good book called Holocaust and Modernity, talked about the Western uh, idea that started in the 18th century and the Enlightenment of social which that states think they can garden the society to put someone in the middle, to put someone in the margin, to eliminate some, and so on and so forth, which culminated in what Nazi Germany did. But every nation state does that in lesser uh, horror than the Nazis, but you can this is what Bauman says. Here, for example, you can see uh, what I said about the others. This is a diagram of uh, Arab population in Israel 2000. So on the upper side, you see, um, so the title is Jewish versus Arab population, but on the upper part you see Jews and others. You can see it in English. And on the lower part, part you see Arab population. Now who are the others if they are not the Arabs? So uh, the book doesn't explain it to the children, but they can assume that these others are non-Jews who are not Arabs and that's why they can be in our group, whereas the Arabs are another group, the Arab citizens. Also visually, you can see that while the couple on the upper side is pretty funny, it doesn't have any ethnic characteristics, but the, on the lower part, you have two racist icons of Arabs, the Arab with the camel and his crouching one. Uh, by the way, this icon appears on every chapter where this book, this geography book, uh, speaks about Arab citizens of Israel. Um, now, uh, Cassandra spoke about the grand narrative, mass narrative. So, of course, in Israel, the mass narrative is the Zionist narrative, and it oh, the history of full books is private. All books have to be authorized by the ministry, and they have to um, to obey some principles and assumptions of this uh, narrative. And I will say, by the way, that all over the world, the reason we have school books, why do we have school books? Why can't we just learn from books? Books are a tool. Slavery hits the Nakba and so forth. Uh, and now, Israeli school books um, are meant to legitimate the Zionist acts of conquest and settlement to both Jewish and same Arab students who received the same book translated to Arabic. Now, the basic assumptions of this master narrative is that Jewish people write on the land, anti-Semitism, and what is called value assumptions, what is good and desirable, Jewish state, Jewish majority, Israeli control. Now, all this, that we will not have another Holocaust. 
and this is very important to understand in the mentality uh, of Israelis. Okay? Um, the Israeli children very, very like Yablonka, Hana Yablonka. Never. How do they have an order for the Holocaust? Not happen again to us. Distance people to them. So, our price. The, the UN as an ambassadors. We will not let them exterminate us again for Hitler. Or teach Jamil, are you uh that that I think Dr. Nurit's connection is just very weak. Um, I'm showing I'm showing a strong connection here on the the Zoom that I'm hosting. So um, I'm not sure there's a whole lot we can do. Maybe maybe we can come back to her at some point. Maybe you three. Can't hear you. You can't hear me now. You're breaking up all the time. You. It will take five minutes. Huh? Mm -hmm. Miko? Yeah. I can go to another room. It will take five minutes. Five minutes? Yes, about five minutes. Yes, I, I just have to, to connect again. Okay, go ahead. All right. Maybe we'll... Um, how, okay, go ahead. We'll... Um, maybe we'll take less than five minutes. Um, so maybe what we'll do, Ilham, maybe we'll uh, let you get started and then Nur can pick up where she left off. All right, sure. Can you hear me okay? And um, now I'm worried about my connection, so I, I hope oh, good. Sounds very good. I want to thank you for including me on um, this panel. It has been very informative so far and it brings up a lot of uh, discussion points that I think are relevant across the three spaces, school systems that we are addressing today. So thank you again, Miko, for including me in this program. I, uh, I want to say that, uh, you know, in addition to my work in research that Jamil mentioned earlier, I also taught social studies to teachers who are becoming teachers in Virginia and uh, at George Mason University for 12 years. And I had the experience of seeing how the Middle East is portrayed in those, uh, in the textbooks as well as the curriculum in general. I think Nurit made the distinction between the textbooks and the curriculum in general. I also have been involved with the work of the National Arab American Women Association and I have been, it's part of my volunteer work here in, the, in Virginia. And we actually went back to look at the SOL's uh, Cassandra, the standards of learning for Virginia, and actually where they mentioned very briefly the Palestinian, the Middle East, very in a very shallow manner and very uh, biased manner, I would add, you would still see that one of the standards and the explanation in history is that the Munich um, attack was marking the beginning of modern terrorism. It's still there in the SOLs. So I wish we are at a place where Fairfax County, Virginia, and general is taking this issue to the scholars and to the teachers to complement, but um, um, I think that we're not there yet. But that's not why you asked me to be here, but there are linkages that I see already, and I'm very happy for that. 
And right. so um, I would like to share my screen. I just have a few presentation slides just to lead the discussion and to help with, uh, uh, with the thoughts and to help me with my thoughts as well. My uh, talk today was to address four questions regarding the Palestinian curriculum. And I, I, I was involved with the Palestinian curriculum in uh, different capacities. One, when I conducted a study on the um, uh, uh, English for Palestine curriculum. And after that, I uh, worked as well. I was invited by the ministry to work on the first uh, national curriculum for Palestine for kindergarten, which is run by the uh, school system. So, I just want to make sure that when we ask the question about the framing between the Palestinian curriculum and the Israeli curriculum and how they portray Palestinians, I am very sad to say that there isn't much difference in terms of the absence and the silencing of the Palestinian people's narrative in the Palestinian curriculum as well as the Israeli. But let's make sure that we know the fact. I get this question a lot from our American audiences and conferences and other places where they ask, why is it that we don't have symmetry? Why don't you talk about this symmetric balance between Israel and Palestine? The basic fact is that there is a state of Israel, but Palestine is not really a, a state that is independent. It's actually under Israeli occupation still, despite Oslo, where the Palestinian Authority that was formed after Oslo was given control, partial control, I would say, uh, of areas A and B. What we're seeing today that area C that was kept out of uh, <clears throat> the Palestinian Authority ruling is actually where the annexation is happening right now with Israel. This is important to know, even when we're talking about the curriculum, because the curriculum and why we have textbooks, Nurit started saying that before she got cut off, we use textbooks to convey messages. And usually governments use textbooks to convey messages about who we are, about national identity, and about the roots and history and so forth, languages, civics, religion, and on and on and on. One of the good results, maybe one of the few good results of the Oslo Accords between Israel and the PLO was actually the establishment of this national curriculum for Palestine. Beyond that, we see that the conflict really did not leave the textbooks, that the war on messaging regarding Palestine, regarding refugees, regarding borders, regarding where is Palestine, what is Palestine, who is Palestine has been left, has been silenced and marginalized in the Palestinian Authority textbooks. So that is a fact that, uh, you know, politics seep into the curriculum and maybe that's why we have the textbooks to, to say that. So in the case of Palestine, after the forming of this committee, high level interventions were evident in the Palestinian curriculum. Hillary Clinton went to Congress appealing to cut uh, funding for the Palestinian Authority because of the curriculum. Clinton himself, the president then went and criticized the Palestinian curriculum. NGOs, donors from the EU and others intervened and wanted to have a voice in the Palestinian curriculum. There's actually one of those committees monitoring NGOs, monitoring the Palestinian curriculum. They call themselves the Institute for Promoting Peace and Cultural Tolerance in Schools. It's a settler funded organization that if you go to their website, they look very peaceful and tolerance is one of their you know, big titles, but their job has been to monitor the language in the Palestinian curriculum, especially in history and uh, Arabic and, and civics. So now that they are expanding their work in the Middle East, they will be happy to know that even on the larger scale of how Arab countries address the Palestinians, the Palestinian issue is actually has been silenced. We look at textbooks from Egypt, Lebanon, even if you look at Anarwa textbooks in Jordan, Egypt, I mean in Jordan and Lebanon, you will also find that the host community history is taught and not necessarily the Palestinian history. And I want to make the distinction between the historic Palestine land 
versus the stories of the Palestinians, including the refugees, including people in Jerusalem who are, uh, were annexed and added to Israel as the capital of Israel. And so, and there are different, you know, diaspora Palestinians. There are the Palestinian Israelis, Palestinian Arabs in Israel that uh, Nuri talked about and how their identity and who they are has been actually absent. Alternative uh, sources has been, have been used, but at the same time, uh, attempts to revise has been very minimal and a lot of people look for information somewhere else. The Palestinian uh, uh, curriculum has been criticized by Palestinians as being too sanitized. And one of the results of our study that we conducted with my colleague at George Mason, uh, Shelley Wong, was that is, uh, English for Palestine was also too sanitized. Children would learn and have passages on London Bridge, but they will not have anything on controversial sites in, in Palestine. The maps were very minimal. Palestine, if mentioned, would be limited to maybe the West Bank, maybe even Gaza. It wasn't, there is no consistency in how we present Palestine in the um, textbooks. So the other engagement I had in the addition to the study is that I came in 2015, I was invited by the minister where she wanted to launch a revision uh, activity around the curriculum. It was 21 years after the curriculum was established. Nobody monitored it in terms of evaluation, monitoring of meeting the goals of the curriculum. No Palestinian voices were you know, um, allowed to be heard. When I attended that conference in 2015, I came with this message from my work in curriculum instruction saying, you know, we need to really decide, are we want to be the Ferraris of the world or the Deweys of the world? Or what, you know, what do we want from the curriculum? What do we want from children in Palestine? And one of the people who stood there immediately stood up and told me he was on the committee of uh, the original curriculum. And he said, listen, when we drew the maps for the Middle East and where is Palestine, the American embassy called me personally and uh, scolded me for using these maps and asked to change the maps in the textbooks. So don't tell me anything about Ferrari. Don't tell me anything about Dewey. Our reality is different. And that was the message I got when I went and gave my talk at, uh, hosted by the ministry. What happened after that, that there was revisions made to the curriculum in 2016, 2017, and those revisions actually didn't go much you know, further other than being, you know, some changes were made, very decorative, very minor. And if you ask anyone, even someone who is a math instructor who worked on the curriculum would tell you it's full of errors and it's not what the Palestinian children deserve. So this whole idea of humanizing the um, occupier, the oppressor, is demanded by powers and forces, but how can you really humanize the oppressor? And I'm talking here about Zionism as a colonial project, not necessarily about Judaism or Jewish, uh, being Jewish. That's not what I'm talking about. It's the Zionist message of the whole land of Israel that is uh, portrayed in many of the um, textbooks, and I think Nurit addressed that a little bit in her talk. But the fact that the Palestinian textbooks are not grounded in the realities of the people, their self uh, asp aspirations for self-determination, all of that has been avoided. That means really that there is room for other sources of information to come into play. If we take the example of Jerusalem, and I want to make sure that this whole issue is really very much connected to money as usual, that the funders, including the Israeli government who collects taxes for the Palestinian Authority for some odd reason, I can't explain, maybe someone else can. You cannot do anything without being aware of the funding sources. So in Jerusalem, for example, when Israel annexed the two parts of the city, it became evident that there is an attempt to take over all the schools. Those schools after Oslo, were supposed to remain under the supervision of the Palestinian Authority. Slowly and eventually, most of the schools had to give up their affiliation 
with the, with the Palestinian Authority to get funding from the municipality. Of course, it also has to do with the Palestinian Authority neglecting the Palestinians in Jerusalem and not giving them salaries. There was continuous irregular paying of their salaries. Schools are really in dire situation. Schools either chose to join the municipality or were forced to do that. And the condition was, if you receive funding, you have to use our curriculum, the Israeli mandated curriculum uh, in Jerusalem. That gives you, an, you know, uh, Jerusalem, I think, brings a lot of the conflict and issues related to the conflict into uh, play, even with the curriculum. The last thing I was involved in as an advisor to the ministry, but also funded by the American Near East, um, 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 Near East uh, Agency, ANIRA, I'm used to saying ANIRA, uh, and uh, Save the Children and other uh, NGOs, international NGOs, my involvement was to lead the team that worked on the national curriculum for Palestine for kindergarten. The Palestinians uh, Authority and the Palestinians never had a curriculum that was uh, Palestinian at its core. They used the, you know, translated curricula coming from other places. They used the Jordanian. They used some pieces that were put together by local uh, NGOs. But there was never what's called a framework for education in kindergarten in Palestine. And there wasn't a national guide and curriculum for teachers. That project lasted for a whole year where I was there physically in Ramallah and uh, worked with a team of ministry people, curriculum people, INGO for a whole year to put this curriculum together. One of the, our units was the beautiful Palestine. Very simple for little kids to learn about the beautiful Palestine. Look outside your window and see the greenery, see the, you know, all of that. But what do Palestinian children see in many places? They see the wall, the separation apartheid wall, and they see checkpoints. So even when we put this beautiful Palestine unit in the curriculum for kindergarten, you cannot really avoid the reality that when you step out of the classroom, you will see graffitis on the walls, you will see messages of liberation on the walls, and that's where those messages become um, not necessarily problematic, but they can become part of what we call the hidden curriculum, right? That this, you know, we learn outside the classroom with our teachers what we want to learn. So in this unit, we try to actually formalize the, and bring it to become legitimate to teach about the maps, to teach about Palestine, to teach about holy places and spaces and so forth. And even when we did that, as mild of a language as we used, we were actually criticized for mentioning that we would like to strengthen the Palestinian identity. And I was called on that and I said, you know what, tune it down. I don't know if I can tune it down even further and be true to what the children of Palestine need. This is an important part in the textbooks. This is an important part in child development and human development. And without having this strength and feeling belonging to a group, you really cannot uh, build other identities and, and develop other identities. So the teachers have a huge role to play. But what happens is with the absence and the silencing of the narrative, Palestinian narrative in the curriculum, we are also unable to address issues like pedagogy and how do you teach. At the beginning of the development of the curriculum center, you know, Ibrahim Abu Lagad and others were into looking at critical thinking and uh, active learning and child-centered learning. What happened is that if you open that up, you will have those questions that teachers don't really know how to answer. Where, you know, what, you know, where are we? Where are our limits? What are, what's going on? And is our national authority doing what they're supposed to do? Those questions, you know, will be silenced, the pedagogy will be silenced at the same time we're silencing the narrative. I think that this connection is important to make that when we rely on memorization, part of why we do that is that we are not trying to raise critical thinkers. We are not trying to raise a new generation that doubts the narrative and want more uh, of what, what makes them belong, what makes them part of that culture and society and aspiration for 
a Palestinian entity, a Palestinian self-determination and so forth. So I think that we are left with some internal questions and I'll close with that. I'll be happy to take questions, but the occupation will end. You know, someone told me, you know, the Ottomans were there for hundreds of years and they faded away. The Zionist colonialist project is there, but it's not gonna stay. We will have our independence. And so the main question is, okay, so how do we prepare for that? And, and you know, Palestinians on this, uh, out of the audience might criticize me for like, well, this is not what we need right now. Well, no, we do have to have these internal conversations about, okay, what remains in the curriculum that will help us ask the question, the right question of, you know, what do we want the Palestinian child to be after being in school for 15, 17 years or so forth? Where do we want to see that Palestinian child, regardless of the occupation or not? And, and, and being someone who grew up in Nazareth, and Nuri talked about that population, which is about 20% of the, maybe 18% of the Israeli population is Palestinian. And I'm from Nazareth, so when I grew up, going to my schooling and through my schooling, we were not even permitted to identify as Palestinians. I got in trouble so many times and, you know, called by, I'm not going to say who, but asked about identifying as a Palestinian, even holding the Palestinian flag, using the symbols of the Palestinian were not something that we would do without being reprimanded and maybe even jailed. So we sought the information outside the textbook. We asked about Mahmoud Darwish and his aspiration for Palestine because we were taught about Rahel, the famous uh, Zionist poet, and her aspiration to be sitting at the Kinneret or the Tiberias Lake that we call it in our um, in Arabic, you know, Tabariya versus Kinneret, which we were taught. We were taught how Rahel and the poet was aspiring to sit and write her poetry at the Kinneret, but we never were taught how Mahmoud Darwish was driven out of his uh, village and his village was destroyed along with 450 more in the Galilee. But that meant we, we, we sought information outside the school and outside the textbooks. And that is something that we need to actually um, talk about. Where do we see that all of those linkages between the Palestinians everywhere, the diaspora in the US, in Europe, in Latin America, in refugee camps in Lebanon, we all have families in the refugee camps in Lebanon. We all have connections to the Palestinians in Jordan. We all have, I have relatives in the West Bank. So that whole fragmentation of the Palestinians it has to come together in some internal dialogue about what are we aspiring for and how we can work together for our own narrative. You know, until now, we don't even have one book for children in the whole Arab world that talks about the Palestinians, the refugees, the Nakba, the, you know, in, in Arabic. Most of the work is scholarly, targeting European audiences, Western audiences, but not something that children could consume. And when I'm asked about resources, we're putting together a list of resources for um, Fairfax County teachers and Loudoun County teachers through our work with NAWA, my work with NAWA Education Outreach Program. And we are, you know, having difficulties finding um, resources, um, you know, in, in Arabic, but there are some in English. So I think that has to be also at the table and I'll stop here and thank you again for including me and I'm happy to respond with some uh, questions that may come up. Thank you, Alham. I, I want to I wanna just touch on a couple of things that you raised before we go back to Nurit and hopefully the Wi-Fi will, will work better this time. But um, Ilham, you talked about um, teaching Palestine, beautiful Palestine to, to Palestinian children who see the army and the settlements and the, and the wall and so on. Um, and uh, it's funny, it just reminds me, I just, I just spoke to Susan Abulhawa yesterday from my podcast about her new book, um, Against the Loveless World, which is really talks a lot about that. But, uh, you know, people always ask, and, and I'm sure they ask you this all the time about the Palestinians teaching hate and the curriculum teaching hate. 
And, you know, and you talk, you touched on that, you know, you want to teach them beauty, but they look outside and what they see across, the, what they see is the, 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 they don't see the beauty. And they're not allowed to travel, especially if they're in the West Bank or Gaza, they're not allowed to travel outside to see other places that are beautiful, although certainly within the West Bank, there are beautiful spots. Um, at the same time, uh, you don't need to teach them to hate because how can you not hate the soldiers and how can you not hate the wall and how can you not hate Israelis and Zionists when this is what they've done to your country? You know, so this is, uh, I think this is, uh, it's, 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 it's a weird predicament. And I know that in Jerusalem, um, it's particularly difficult because they're under so many different pressures within Jerusalem because they have an added element that they don't have in 1948 schools and they don't have in the West Bank, am I, if, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, and I remember uh, I was invited to speak in Jerusalem at the, I forget what it's called. It's a high school. It's called the, is it called the, the International School or the Jerusalem School? Right. Nice. Where yeah. they teach in English. And they're supposed to be kind of all for dialogue and all for beauty and all for working together and they speak English. But in the Q&A and the, after the lectures, um, the older students came up to me and they were fuming. And how dare I even talk about hope? How dare I talk about, you know, because I talk about a free Palestine from the river to the sea and, and you know, that vision. Of, of moving beyond the two states and all that. And there are a few things, how can you talk to us about this nonsense when look what we're facing, you know? And these are young, young, very, you know. So obviously they didn't learn this in school is what I'm saying. These aspects of their identity, these aspects of, of what they know, they obviously didn't need to learn in school because this is the life that they lead. Um, another thing that I think is, um, so when, when you talk about preparing them for independence, what is the context? Is it independence along, you know, this kind of what I consider to be a, a, a um, imaginary, mythical two-state solution kind of independence or a more realistic independence, a post-Zionist, one person, one vote, right of return kind of independence. So is, do you have an answer for that? In other words, in, other words, in talking about preparing Palestinians for independence, is it along the mythical lines of, of, of the Zionist uh, kind of, uh, perspective or is it a real free Palestine? What, what do you see when you, when you talk about that? Yeah, and you know, this is a, a big question I, and I, I don't represent any, the Minister of Education or the Palestinian Authority and anything. If I answer this question, I will answer it as Ilam. But uh, what happens usually is that when we talk about these topics, even when we were putting the curriculum, the guide together, these conversations came up. What do we teach children? And people from the ministry would always say, oh, oh let, let's not talk about that. This is controversial. We want to teach peace. We want to teach justice, da, 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 da. But when we talk about beautiful Palestine, we end up talking about olive picking and the beauty of bringing olives. And they love this olive idea. And even when you talk about olives, you cannot not talk about the destruction of uh, olive trees and, you know, by the settlers. For me, when I talk about independence, I think that it has to have the core of independence from the beginning, from the family, to the neighborhood, to the community, to the larger context. Whether it's a two-state solution, which I don't think is viral, I agree with you. To the one-state solution, I think this is where we're heading and I agree with a lot of people. But we also have to do something about how would this be managed, how would it be beyond the post-Zionist uh, rhetoric and we see that even within the Israeli society there aren't really total agreements on what's gonna happen next so in my opinion I think we're moving away from this limited notion of independence from the two state to the one state but this is Ilham and not necessarily my work or my uh, work with the ministry. Fine. Your, your voice is good enough as you are you don't need to be representing <laughs> anyone. Exactly uh, no I don't want to be blamed for saying something and the thing is, how do you teach about a beautiful Palestine without teaching about uh, Lake Tabaria? How do you take Lake Tabaria, uh, the whole story of Dahir al-Omar, which nobody, of course, in Israel ever heard of, uh, who that was his environment, which is so beautiful and so powerful. Without teaching that, where do you go? So you have to include 1948 Palestine. You have to include Lake Tabaria. He developed yes. Tabaria. He built Tabaria. He built Haifa. He built these yes. cities. He created Akka. You know what I mean? You can't yeah. really talk about a beautiful Palestine without expanding Palestine beyond the Bantustans of the West Bank. And I want to touch on one, 
I'm and sorry, we, we actually address that through what we called the, um, not necessarily the history of Palestine, but the landmarks, major landmarks of Palestine, including, you know, um, the mosque, the Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, the Akka, you know, um, uh, what is that, the mosque there in Akka, and all of these, were, you know, are part of what we called, not necessarily uh, addressing it in current terms, but more as yeah. historic sites of uh, of Palestinians. That's and how there's we... uh, the 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 Ayn Omar Mosque in Tabaria, yes. which is barely standing still, but it's still a very beautiful and incredibly important part of the historical Palestine. I, I want to touch on one more thing with you, if I may. And by the way, speaking of the Ayn Omar, I would highly recommend people to buy Ibrahim Nasrallah's uh, wonderful epic uh, saga. The Lanterns of the King of Galilee, which is about the whole story of the Harir Omar, which is is not very well known, even though he played such a significant role in the in the history of, of, of Palestine, the more recent history of Palestine, 18th century. Yes. Um, but you talked about um, the percentage of the citizens, the Palestinians among, you know, which is an interesting way that Israel does math. It's a very strange math because they count the Palestinians when they when they talk about when they talk about population, they count the Palestinians who have citizenship, but these are only Palestinians who live within certain boundaries, whereas they don't count the other Palestinians who live in under boundaries, but they do count the Israeli Jews who, who live anywhere. So it's a very, very strange kind of, of, of math that they do when they count the population. So certain Palestinians, and really the Palestinian citizen, the citizenship, that idea that identity that the particular certain group of Palestinians have is really the only remnant of the pre-1967 reality. It's that's the only right. thing that still exists because Jews have gone everywhere beyond 1967 anyway. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, uh, that's interesting. And also I think, you know, in, in being afraid and being arrested for holding the Palestinian flag, you know, you go around Nasra, you go around the Nakab, you go around Palestinian towns in 1948, you see the Palestinian flag everywhere. And you see uh, Najil Ali and then and, and Mohandala everywhere in Yafa. You see it everywhere. In other words, the identity as Palestinian has been strengthened. You know, I have friends in the Nakab, uh, Palestinian Bedouin. They have no question about their identity as Palestinians. They also happen to be have this dubious citizenship, but that goes beyond that. Um, so I think that's yeah, also very, I, my experiences have been like late seventies, early eighties, where you know, yeah. But that was the reaction to not allowing people to learn about who they are, which you're, you're pointing out. Of course, and I think in the seventies, people still talked about, still use the term Israeli Arab, whereas today, nobody nobody uses that. The Palestinians don't. I don't know any Palestinians, and I know many Palestinians who live in you know in in nineteen forty eight. So anyway, I just wanted to. Um, to touch on these points that, that you raised, uh, so thank you for that. Nurit, how are we? How are we doing? Can we? Are you ready to proceed? Hopefully, we'll hear you better because you were a little choppy before. Okay. Did Rami save the day? Uh, no. Okay. Problem. It's a general problem. Anyway. Okay. Um. So I was here. And I said that in order to inculcate the, the idea of removing people, eliminating people, distancing people, first you have to do is turn them into some kind of abstraction, for example, to a problem. Okay, we all know that. Oh, now it doesn't move. What's going on? Okay. Uh, we know that the Jews were called the Jewish problem, and it was very good in order to convince the Germans that they are superfluous and that they have uh, to be eliminated somehow. So wherever you have racism and, and what is called minorities, you turn them into problems. So uh, Palestinians are called the refugee problem, developmental problem, demographic problem, and security threat. And all these problems in the books are problems that we have to solve. For example, here, uh, the caption tells you that this is a Palestinian problem, but of course you don't see anybody, okay? It's just a problem without people, and it could be any sort of slum problem or poverty problem or any problem, but the caption tells you it's the Palestinian problem, and then they tell you that, 
although Israel came victorious out of the survival war that was forced upon her, the Palestinian problem would poison for more than a generation the relationship of Israel with the Arab world and with the international community. So this problem really acts by itself. It's a self-directed uh, force. It becomes a poison. Again, uh, one of the strategies, the best strategies of, of, of eliminating people from consciousness is just not to show them. So here, for example, you have Jabalia a refugee camp, which is, I think, the most crowded place in the world, but you don't see any people. And uh, Theo van Leeuwen, who, uh, uh, who studied the uh, Dutch and Swedish textbooks, and the presentation of the third world, he says that this is uh, the angle of the pilot, Hala is too high to be able to see the people on whom he's dropping the bomb. And this is what education calls the objective point of view. Uh, for example, when you, uh, one book, on, only one book I found that shows a checkpoint, but this checkpoint is empty of people. Okay, it's, it's, it's a flying checkpoint, it's not even a stable one. And it's very abstract for the children who are going to do checkpoints when they go to the army in two years. It seems quite lovely. And then they ask the question, what is the purpose of the checkpoint? How it represents our defensive democracy? What is administrative detention? What is the advantage? What is the disadvantage? All that is possible because they don't really see the people. They don't see this, and of course they don't see this. Israelis will never see these pictures. So for them, a checkpoint is, is not so bad. And uh, Miko talked about the population. So another way to really exclude people and eliminate them symbolically is to exclude them from maps, what is called topographic uh, silence in geography. So here you have an Arab population, and uh, you don't know Hebrew, but I'll tell you that on this map there isn't one Arabic city, not even Nazareth, not even Akka. Only Jewish cities, and the idea is, as you see, that they live not only among us, but upon us, which is the most frightening things for Jews. Now the best bank is designated as an area we have no data for. So maybe there are no people there at all. All right. And of course, you have the idea of mental maps. As I told you, when you use the racist discourse, those groups, you have to portray them as violent, primitive, and unnecessary, really. Unnecessary. I don't think that we should, I don't think we should talk about hate, but these people are really, as the Jews in Germany, are portrayed as unnecessary. Okay, I read that during World War II, there was a survey and the less hate for Jews was found in Germany. The, the, the highest one was in, in France, but they just were superfluous, that's all. So, uh, factors that limit the development of Arab village. Arab villages are far from the centers. The roads to them are difficult. They have remained out of the process of change and development. They are hardly exposed to modern life. And that's why it's very hard to connect them to water. And that's when you should think you're talking about Australia. While in Israel, the largest uh, width of Israel is 50 kilometers. Uh, second, what you have to do after you exclude them and abstract them uh, is really legitimate the confinement, okay? So one source of legitimation is say that we need the land, okay? And we have to protect the land for fear that an Arab sequence would cause the detachment of Galilee, for example, from Israel. And here they're speaking about the citizens. As I told you before, Arab citizens cannot buy land. And the book, this is another book, says there's no contradiction between our democracy being exclusionary and segregationist, and it's being a democracy. Okay, between the fact that Israel is comprised of civil nation, of citizens, and the fact that several ethnocultural minorities don't have national rights. 
And they say it in a way that, of course, does not invite any discussion about it. And if they suffer, of course, it's their own fault. Okay, you can read it. I don't have to read it for you. Okay, they have to accept the minority status. And when you go to war, you cannot lament your defeat and so on. Now, this kind of discriminatory conditions are naturalized in the book. Okay? 45 settlements are unrecognized by the state. This is it. It's a fact. Again, an assertion. It doesn't invite any discussion, any contradiction. That's the way it is. That's why they don't have electricity, water, and super infrastructure and so on. That's the way it is. We can live in a place where 45 settlements of citizens are unrecognized and don't receive any services. Now, the confinement, of course, legitimates the military government and the occupation. This is one book you can read. Of course, the vacant lands are the lands confiscated from these same uh, people. And their famous law of citizenship. Okay, the book brings the law of citizenship, which does not allow um, Palestinian families to live together if one of them is from Israel and another is uh, from the territory. And the book said that some defend the law in the name of Israel's defensive democracy and the danger of error, which is always the ultimate excuse. And the other uh, def uh, defense is from national reasons. We want to keep the Jewish character of the state. Now, the Supreme Court said it was unconstitutional, but rejected the petition against it because it was an emergency law. And the book says, human rights are not a recipe for national suicide, which is a quote from uh, Supreme Court uh, Aon Barak. Now, what is called majoritarianism, this is the, 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 the main thing about Israel. The, the highest value, the highest need, the highest necessity is to be a majority. Anything. This, is, this justifies anything, okay? So for example, Plan B, which was the cleansing of all the villages from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, strengthened the military power and created a Jewish territorial sequence as a strategic asset. And this is good. I mean, this justifies it. It just it legitimates it. I wouldn't say just that. And then, of course, after all that, it's very easy to legitimate uh, killing and exclusion. All right? So, as I said, you have to use racist discourse to persuade the children that these people are superfluous and need to be eliminated somehow. Okay, so this shows you how primitive they are and how asocial they are. They are unwilling to give anything to the general good. And you stereotype them. When you stereotype people, Bauman says, whatever marks remains of the face serves the badges of membership, the signs of belonging to a category of which the owner of the face is but a specimen. This is, for example, the only ways that Palestinian citizens are depicted visually in Israeli school books are, one, primitive farmers, you see? two, the racist icon that we saw before. Okay, nobody looks like that. Nobody looks like that in the whole world. Nobody looks like that. Nobody ever looked like that. Nobody ever <laughs> no. It's taken from Alibaba stories with European drawings. Terrorists and refugees. You'd never see an Arab teacher, writer, doctor, actor, singer, musician, nothing. And what Alport said in 1957, if you know his very good book, the victim group has long been typed. People have begun to lose the power to think of them as individuals. 
okay? Now, this majoritarianism legitimates killing. The escape of the Arabs following the Diriacin massacre solved a terrifying demographic problem. And even a moderate person such as the first president, Weizmann, spoke about it as a miracle. Okay? That's the point. We are not rejoicing the death, but we are legitimating it by the far-reaching consequences, which is called in the literature consequential explanation. You take the consequences and you explain, okay? After another massacre, here I, I quoted Membe, I hope you know him, Achil Membe. Each enemy killed makes the survivor feel more secure. So the Kibia massacre, the slaughter of innocent Palestinians in their homes brought about some confidence to Jews in their homes and restored the morale and dignity to the army and helped it become a deterring, vigorous army and so on and so forth, okay? So they don't say there was no slaughter, but it was good for the Jews. After the 56 campaign in Sinai, these are the questions. 50 Egyptians were killed, 40 were taken prisoners. In what way can such a headline influence the morale of Israeli citizens? Okay. Do you think it was enough? Now the books don't give a uh, explanations really why they should be killed. Sometimes they do very rarely and then it's technical. The loudspeaker encouraging the inhabitants of Syria to leave the village didn't work. So they were killed. Or the soldiers did not know the people were hiding in their homes that night. By the way, this is what Ben Gurion said, the Prime Minister. And the overall claim of the books is the positive outcome for us, they condone or overlook evil done to them. This is a phrase by Zizek, he said, everywhere where you have state violence, this is the claim. And I'm going back to what I said before. Every measure taken against Palestinians protect Israeli Jews from another Holocaust. And that's why you have to Nazify them, as the Prime Minister does and as everybody does. And this is a bit of a paradox because on one hand, they are portrayed as primitive and undeveloped. On the other hand, they are portrayed as almighty and Nazis. This is Netanyahu's speech. I'm not going, you can read it later. And this equation of Palestinians to Nazis establishes the rule of power as an existential necessity and strengthens the us versus anything Arab. Anything Arab is going to be Hitler. Anyone. Or Irani or Okay, I say that. And what they do, they command the Israeli students to ignore the other drama, that of the victims. And look ahead of injustice to the favorable consequences for the Israeli nation. Okay, which is the political way, the, uh, the military way. And they teach what uh, another, this uh, Caroline Coffin, she studied uh, school books in Australia. They all have the same problems, yeah? And she said they teach the discourse of power of politicians, of generals, and mistake the disciplinary politics of truth. And they teach what is called elite racism, which is a racism that comes from above, from education, from leaders, and so on. It's a racism that inscribes itself in practices, in discourse, representations, but it is meant to, it, 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 it expresses the need to purify the society, to preserve one's own or our identity from all forms of missing, interbreeding, or invasion. This is the great fear. Now, that's why the, the society is thus uh, divided. 
Oh, there are only 20%. You know, 50 meters from here, there are another 4 million, but we don't count them. I'm done. Thank you. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, just a couple of points that I was going to, that I'll, the, from the things that you said, Noit, um, you're showing that map and you said not a single Arab city, but I think what, uh, they're not showing a single, they're showing many Arab cities because Haifa is an Arab city and Asdod is it was an Arab city, but these cities yeah, that were but what is over, yeah. So it's really cities that weren't either colonized uh, or, or ethnically cleansed or, or subjected. No, but to I, what I it was, they don't show a city whose population is Arab. Of course, yes. Okay, in Netanya, you don't have Arabs. In Haifa, it is mixed, yes. Right. But in Netanya and Haria and all this, you don't have Arabs as part of the population, and the map is about Arab population. Precisely, yeah, yeah, I get that. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, and it's interesting that, uh, but that again, some of these cities used to be Arab. Um, yes. And then, um, the remoteness of the of the Arab villages, which is why they don't get uh, water. But of course, as soon as there's a Jewish settlement, suddenly the water finds a way and the electricity find a way and the roads find a oh, way to get there overnight, which is very interesting as well. The thing is that they are not remote. You cannot say remote or 20 kilometers from the center. No, but of course. The thing, the thing about, about uh, mental maps is that people don't really know the territory. They only know the map. And right. when you inculcate a kind of mental map, it influences them. Uh, Alport said on election day. Okay? That's right. why when people say they are streaming in, okay, they don't know the map. They don't know where they come from. So it's, it's a wonderful uh, trick right. to, 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 to create such a mental map. And right. also, and it excuses. The, the discrimination, I mean, they're so far away. And nobody asks, excuse me, there's another book where they say, uh, at A80, a lot of Jews came to Jaffa port from Poland, from Russia, from the Balkan, and even from far away Yemen. And I also have always say to my students, take a ruler and tell me who is the, what country is the closest. But the thing is that this book went through four committees. And this is the power of mental maps. Nobody saw that. And this is, it's a great power of mental maps. Yeah. And that's why they do it, yes. Another point you touched on, the 45 unrecognized towns in the Nekab, which of course we know get no services and, and the poverty there levels are very, very high. And now with COVID, the conditions of COVID there are terrible. Um, and it's interesting because number one, like you said, these are citizens of the state of Israel, uh, about half and of And they the serve in the army. And many of them serve, and it's not, not all, many of them serve. And we're talking about over 100,000 people. In other words, the, the actual population of these unrecognized towns is, is over 150, close to 150,000 Palestinian citizens of Israel. Um, and what's also interesting that quite often across the street from some of these towns, you have the Israeli colonies and the highest standard of living and some of the highest standards of living in Israel are in the Israeli settlements in the Nakab. So you have Omer, which is, you know, maybe the fourth richest town in, in all, all Israeli town across the street from a township called Tel Saba, which the poverty levels are hor horrifying. Um, and so we can accept it when it's, when it's the Arabs living in poverty and all this, but even though across the street, you've got all these Jewish only towns that have everything, nobody's questioning, well, how, why does this make sense? Why is this recognized? And if you're gonna build a Jewish colony or a new town, why not include everybody in the new town? Why do we have to completely continue to segregate even when we're talking about citizens of the state within what they call right. the legitimate part, so to speak, of the state but of Israel? As you, as you said before, citizenship or citizenry does not count in Israel. Israel is the state of all the Jews wherever they live, not the state of its citizens. Yeah. The citizens are discriminated by law. Yeah. It's not a state that counts its citizens at all. That's why, for example, now 17,000 American Jews are going to come to Israel when Palestinians are in closure. 
because Israel is theirs. And when I say Israel, it's the whole Israel Palestine. Yeah. That's uh, yeah. that's a concern. Nobody speaks about citizens and the rights of citizens. Yeah. Only yeah. the rights of Jews. And of course, and the rights of minorities. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you count them, they are not a minority. Of course. Of course. Which is why they do this funny math. Okay, I think we can probably open it up to questions now. So, Jamil, I wanted to uh, to say something about Ilham's uh, speech. Uh, Talk, please. Can I? Yeah, please. Yeah, of course. Yeah, something that I think should be very clear is that Palestinians can plan and do whatever they want, but their curriculum is financed by World Bank, by the EU, and so on and so forth, who actually work for Israel. So they cannot do what they want in their books. Of course, they cannot teach hate because it is censored and they cannot plan anything without the consent of these uh, financiers who really work for Israel. And what happens now in East Jerusalem really is the, that they are all uh, passing to the Hebrew uh, Israeli uh, curriculum because they're fed up and they want a university that functions and they hope to get some jobs. And it's a huge change what is going on there because before that they were studying the Palestinian curriculum censored. And my colleague Samia Alayan could not be here today, but she has a wonderful uh, book about education in East Jerusalem, in East Jerusalem but also she has an article called the blank, the white pages, where she shows that children receive textbooks where you have the heading of the chapter and then three or four white pages because it's deleted. Yeah. So the situation is not whether Palestinians are doing this or that, but whether they can do anything at all. And that is why the, 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 the phrase of teaching hate is so irrelevant here. Even if they wanted to, I don't think they want to, they have other troubles, but even if they wanted to, they are censored. They are so censored that they cannot speak about the Nakba, they cannot speak about the refugees, they cannot speak about, they cannot speak about anything. I think they teach Islam up to the 17th century and that's it. So it's very heavy occupation on education. I had a student who was a teacher, an Israeli Arab student who was a teacher, and he told me the first time I met Mahmoud Awish. It was a translation in a class, so I brought all kinds of poems, and he said it's the first time. So it's not like you have a choice and you, you say, okay, we'll, we'll be nice. You just don't have a choice. Yeah, but they control the textbooks. They cannot control the narrative outside. Right. You go That's in right. and see Palestine all over, from PLO leader Yasser Arafat, images everywhere, to singing, to music, to, I mean, yeah, agree. Yeah, and also, I... the, the books that so-called teach hate, and we should be very careful about it, are not the books that are issued in the ministry. There are books who are written and issued by private groups, just like in Israel. In Israel, we have books written by very known rabbis that are given to soldiers and tell them to kill Palestinian babies and rape Palestinian women. But these are not the Ministry of Education books. We're not there yet. Ilham, I wanted to ask you the name of the, the, name of the NGO, the, the monetary NGO, that you said is actually run by settlers. What, what is it called again? Can you give us that name? It's, um, it's funded by settlers. At least that's what I found on the website. But the Institute for Monitoring Peace oh. and Tolerance in Schools, IMAP. Impact. I Monitoring impact. Peace and Tolerance in Schools? Yeah, they no, were no, they're called monitoring impact. the Palestinian... Impact. Impact was monitoring the Palestinian curriculum. Now they monitor the whole Middle East and they should be happy because there's nothing in the whole Middle East about the Nakba, about refugees, about not much. 
right. Okay. All right. Now, this okay. organization is not academic, although they present themselves as scholars. They are yeah. not academic. They rented a room in the university, and that's why they call themselves university people. They cannot yeah. publish in any respectable publication, never. But they have huge power in Europe. Yes. Huge power. Lots of money. Uh, two years ago or a year ago, they almost made the European Union cut the budget to the uh, Ministry of Education in Ramallah. And uh, I was called urgently. And I took Samira with me and we went to the European Parliament. We went to the meeting and uh, we said what we had to say. They reversed the decision. Now they took it again. But plus, And then Samira asked uh, this impact man, can you show us the book from which you took your examples? And he said later, and he just ran out of the room. And I'm talking European Parliament, okay? But they have yeah. huge, huge uh, influence. They get money from UNESCO. They get money from the American Congress. And they, it's really a fraud. It's really a fraud. All right, let's open it up, Jamil. Let's go ahead and open it up for questions. Okay. Uh, first question is from Claire. The question is, do Palestinian students learn Hebrew and vice versa? Should I? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, Palestinians uh, officially learn Hebrew. Uh, and the Israelis officially learn Arabic. Are we talking about Israelis? the West Bank? <laughs> no, I'm talking about uh, East Jerusalem and Israel, inside Israel. Okay, so that's uh, a we need to make clarify. Okay. Uh, West, uh, the residents of East Jerusalem and the citizens of Israel, they learn Hebrew in school. Uh, it's not very successful because it's very problematic to learn the language of the, of the enemy and so on. Now there is a huge project of uh, training Palestinian teachers of Hebrew. And I teach them and it's amazing. I mean, they have to really do all kinds of juggling in, in order to teach the children this language. But the thing is that in Israeli schools, it is presented as very important for the army to know Arabic. And in the Palestinian schools, it's presented as very important because there is no college or Palestinian in Arabic in Israel. They must learn in, in, in Hebrew-speaking institutes. And it's, it's a huge problem for them, really huge problem. So in, in, um, in the West Bank, uh, some of the schools of, offer Hebrew, if that's the question, and uh, some of the secondary schools offer Hebrew. But if I'm not mistaken, it's all electives if you choose to, and not all of them, of course, offer Hebrew. Now remember also that Israel, uh, Arabic was an official language in Israel until a few years ago when it ceased to be a formal official language of the state. Now it's only Hebrew and that, that impacts how people feel about learning Hebrew, not just the enemy, the oppressor, but, but also the status of the language in the country. Okay. Okay. Um, this one is from uh, Winifred, and it's, uh, it's more a comment than a question, but I think it could lead us to an interesting uh, conversation. Um, so they're referencing the, the children's book called P is for Palestine. And they're saying that this book was protested against vehemently by Zionist communities in the United States. That's right. Also, the inclusion of Arabic in the state of California's curriculum has been under attack by a combination of ultra-right and Zionist groups to the point where it may probably be withdrawn this Thursday. So mm -hmm. they're bringing up uh, P.S. for Palestine and then the, um, the state of California's curriculum also being under attack. If, if any of the mm -hmm. panelists have, have comments about either of those. Well, the P for Palestine was written by an Iranian American author who wanted to teach something about Palestine to bring to light, you know, what, what the alphabet and teaching young children about Palestine. And it actually has been banned in some libraries around the 
state and of course immediately was attacked by different groups. It's a lovely book, I think, and uh, I use it, I give it as gifts to people who need to know more. So I do recommend it highly to those 134 people on this chat. Yeah, I second that. It's a lovely kid's book. Uh, opposing it is is uh, is absolutely delusional. Opposing it, saying anything wrong with it. Nuri, do you know the book, Peace for Palestine? Oh. Have you seen it? I'll get you okay. one. I'll send you one. It's a okay. very okay. sweet little book, kid's book. You know, I'd like to um, uh, offer a point. Um, there's a lot of um, discussion about what you should expose uh, the younger children to. Um, and whenever you bring up these hard issues, um, there's always the pushback that this is teaching hate, that this is teaching uh, a subject that they are not yet ready to understand. And I don't know how many people remember being that age, but there are a lot of concepts that you can understand. And if you want, if you know that the first seven years of your life are critical, it imprints the way that you see your society and culture. If you do not include information about the hypocrisy of society and, and children understand um, mistreatment, they understand when when they're held to one standard and other people are held to another standard that often is inferior to their standard. They understand how, how you can do harm to groups of people. They get that. Um, but we don't teach that in the world. We lighten the, the understanding of young people to, I call this a very Pollyannish view of life and the world. And then children are faced with the reality of information, usually by the time they reach in, in the, in the uh, curriculum of, of the U.S. generally is the middle or junior high school levels, or sometimes even high school levels. And the worst case scenario is they're never introduced to, this, to these concepts. And then they walk away with a false understanding because their, their sense of the world is governed by a, a very narrow and inaccurate narrative. Um, and so I'm a, a strong advocate that young children need to be faced with these things and you can make it age appropriate, but they need to learn about these things. And that's why there's been so much resistance to even using the word slavery in the American curriculum, which is nonsense since the overwhelming majority of American history was slavery. And, and yet people keep talking about it like a chapter in American history. And I call it, oh, this must be a two chapter book. Because if you say that's a chapter and you ignore everything else, then it must be a very, very short discussion. And so, you know, if, and, and you all have a more difficult time incorporating Palestinian history because you have the religious side of, of the West. Uh, the West that sees the Arabs as the enemies, um, as somehow anti-God, uh, as the crusaders against God. And, and so then you're, you're sort of caught up with this cultural um, narrative, uh, really fueled by religious ideas, that somehow to talk about Palestinians as human beings and as people whose land was invaded is an affront to God. Can I ask you uh, just a follow up on that, Cassandra? So you talked about slavery. What about what about the uh, Native American issue? How how early would you introduce that, and how briefly? I know we. I mean, you could probably teach a whole you know se well, semester on that. Well, in so many ways, um, and especially along the East Coast of the United States, Native American history is inextricably connected and tangled up with African American history. And that, and most people don't even realize that Native peoples were enslaved. You had uh, for years a number of Latin Americanists who made the argument 
that slavery was only African-based, that there were no Native Americans who were enslaved, which was nonsense. In Virginia, they captured um, uh, Native children especially, but sometimes adults, and they sold them into slavery in other parts of Virginia or Maryland or the Carolinas or in Massachusetts. Um, and so there is this very bizarre narrative about Native Americans as somehow being like Pocahontas. And so you see this Native American narrative that ends their presence after Pocahontas dies, uh, that somehow there's this coalition between Native and peoples and, and the English people coming in and they reconcile very quickly, and this marriage was a reconciliation, and then we move on, and, and the thought is they, they simply intermingled themselves and disappeared. And of course, Native peoples are not monolithic. Uh, the experiences of those on the East Coast is very different as we move further West, and as we go North and South on the two continents, and, and of course, the whole Native experience in the Caribbean has been all too often ignored that they were extinguished as a group of people, so much so that when you think of a Caribbean, a Native Caribbean, you think of someone of African descent as opposed to a Native person. And so, you know, the, the story is very, very complicated very diverse, very local oriented and, you know, regionally based. Um, but, you know, you look at how Native peoples have tried to reconstitute themselves over the many generations. There's this idea that somehow Native peoples just started to create themselves as nations or, or reconstituted themselves as nations in the 20th century. When you can see the reconstitution as far back as the 18th century. But each time they've made that effort, they've been uh, either marginalized, isolated, or completely destroyed using the military power of the United States or vigilante groups. Andrew Jackson uh, was a vigilante who used um, a gang of people who had weapons and attacked the Seminole Indians to destroy their bulkhead in Georgia and in the northern part of Florida, primarily because they were uh, providing sanctuary to uh, freedom seekers, to African and African American freedom seekers who created communities along with them, or in some cases separate, but within their larger territories and began to adopt the culture of the native peoples in that region. It's interesting, it's interesting. In, in the, uh, the American, the Native American uh, Museum in DC, the Smithsonian, it's all described basically as some big cultural misunderstanding. So it's very, very troubling. Okay, Jamil, should we go on? Do you have another question, other questions? Yes. So this one is from Joanna. The question is, do educators in Israel challenge the curriculum? Are they forced to te teach such propaganda? And is there a disciplinary, disciplinary action taken against them if they do challenge it? Um, most of them don't. People are very patriotic in Israel and the security threat really paralyzes them. But in the last two years, there have been two teachers who dared say something uh, against the army and against what is going on in the territories, and they were uh, fired. But uh, there's one uh, principal in Tel Aviv of a very prestigious school, who is two, really, who are doing it all the time, and nobody touches them. But this is a special case because nobody would touch them. And they are really militants and they don't let army people come into the schools. I don't know if you know, but in Israel, from kindergarten, army people come to the classes and build the admiration uh, for the army and, and prepare them to be soldiers and so on. So these two principles uh, object and they don't let these people, uh, the army people in. But 
I told you about four people, okay? But usually the, the teachers, even if they know, I see it on my students who are all teachers, uh, when we study textbooks, um, they know, they realize what is going on, but it is very, it is very hard to, to change and and bring uh, other things. It's I think that in Israel we have so far more academic freedom than in other countries that I know, like uh, like the UK for example. Okay, um, teachers can really do what they want. Nobody checks what you teach, especially not in university, but also in school. But there is this patriotism and self censorship. And um, the study that I quoted before of Avner Ben Amos, who just came out, he said the same thing. They could have done more, but they don't want to. Okay, they think it's wrong. They think if they do that, the children will not want to be soldiers. And this is the main ob objective of education. Okay. Uh, may I just point out? May I just point out here that when we talk about Israeli schools. I just want to point out for people to know that the Palestinian system of education within Israel is separate from the Jewish Israeli school system and the rules that Nuri just described of academic freedom don't really work in the Palestinian system but and also Nuri I'm sure you meant perceived the security threat not necessarily an immediate security threat on Israel right the perceived which Netanyahu and other use it as a narrative to keep people afraid in Israel because this security threat legitimizes what we do to the Palestinians. This Nazization you mentioned is all about that, but it's totally inaccurate. We have friends, Israelis have friends all the way to the Gulf. I mean, just, I don't want to start naming, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, the systems are separate. And of course, what I said applies only to Jewish schools. Um, in uh, Arab Israeli schools, uh, there's no way anyone can object to anything. Uh, most of them are appointed by uh, by the authorities, and they are constantly examined. They are constantly supervised. Uh, they are constantly uh, spied on. Uh, their Facebooks are broken in and it's a different uh, it's a different uh, reality altogether you're right different reality the, the academic freedom is for Jews only that's right okay next okay this one is from Roxanne and the question is what is the state of refugee camp education is it of the same standard as state Palestinian schools? Sorry, I, I missed the first part of the question. Sure, I'll sure. repeat it. So the first part of the question is, what is the state of refugee camp education? Is it of the same standard as state Palestinian schools? Well, I mean, most of them are run by ANARWA, the UN Agency for Refugees. And um, some people might say that previously, historically, now ANARWA doesn't receive funding from the US and most of the funding comes outside the US. So it's been under a lot of uh, pressure in terms of uh, managing the ANARWA system. But in refugee uh, camps, the the schools, like in Lebanon refugee camps, Jordan, and in Palestine, the schools have their own system that is separate from the Palestinian Authority. And they tend, looking at reports, I was just looking at ANARWA reports and their website, they, they tend to adopt the host country curriculum. So in Palestine, they use some of those borrowed from Jordan and, uh, and Lebanon, but they don't. There are about 712 or 13 ANARWA schools in the three locations in Lebanon, Jordan, and Palestine. And uh, in, uh, in the Palestinian territories in Palestine, they use some of the materials from Jordan, Lebanon, but some a lot from the Palestinian Authority textbooks. It's a choice. They don't have to use 
the Palestinian Authority textbooks. All right, move on to the next one. Yeah. This one is from Anna. What does academic cooperation between Arabic and Jewish scholars look like in Israel? Uh, I think it's a very personal thing. Uh, there's no encouragement to do things together. But uh, if you have, you know, a colleague and you do the same thing, like me and Samia Alayan, we do the same thing. She studies uh, Palestinian curriculum and I study Israeli curriculum. So we go to each other's class and we give lectures. But when we ask for a joint class, uh, we haven't got it yet. <laughs> Okay, and I'm going to retire next year. So, uh, but they, they, they are, they are, they are corporations, but it's, it's on a personal level. It's not something that is encouraged by the state or by the authority. Yeah, we have to remember also that there is a call for boycott, the um, Palestinian call for academic and cultural boycott, which, which, with which I have to say I agree, but uh, that of course is playing a part, uh, playing a role in, in that as well. <clears throat> right. So that kind of a collaboration is frowned upon because there's a, it, uh, it's in violation of the, of the call for boycott. <clears throat> yeah, like uh, my book was uh, studied in Birzeit and then the students wanted to invite me for a talk and the university did not agree. You remember we we went to the Quakers in Ramallah instead. That's right. I remember. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah. the students wanted to invite me because they read the book, but uh, the university said no. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next. How much time do we have? Uh, it's uh, kind of uh, over time. Anyway. Much, we're pretty much at two hours now. I I can do one more question if you Let's want. Let's do one more and then we'll. Okay. Maybe some final yes. comments. This question is for Ilham. Uh, why hasn't the PA ever conducted its own study of Israeli textbooks? Is it planning to? The PA is the Ministry of uh, the Ministry of Education, which is the education arm of the Palestinian Authority. is not mandated to do this kind of uh, work, but there are scholars in Hebron and Khalil University and others who are doing that kind of uh, examination. It's more scholarly work, academic work examining the curriculum. I don't think it's the PA's job to really do that, but left to the people who are educators and looking at the curriculum and examining what's being taught. And that's been done. That is been, I don't think it's enough. And if you look at, uh, you know, studies on the Palestinian curriculum, but also monitoring and evaluation, that is the responsibility of the, the Ministry of Education. And they don't do that because I think two different reasons. Intentionally, it's better not to evaluate the curriculum because there's a lot of issues with it, especially when it has to do with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Second, you're going to have to find people who fund such a study. And I think that's, there is a unit of evaluation, but they do mostly academic type of evaluation, not necessarily an evaluation monitoring of the curriculum. I insisted on having that component when I worked with them on the kindergarten curriculum, but that hasn't been done yet. Um, so it's unfortunate, but that's not there. In terms of the academic study of the messages of the curriculum and goals, I think there are people at certain different universities in Palestine who work on that. And maybe we can highlight some of those people, Ilham, in the post-webinar email so that sure. people can, can look into their, scholar yes. their scholarship. Uh, and the last thing is we they, we also received a lot of questions about um, whether this this conversation will be made available afterwards. Just so everyone knows, right after this ends, you'll be able to watch this on Facebook right away because it's recording. But, um, you know, give us a couple of days and we'll get this up on MikoPella.com as a YouTube video that you can share with everyone and also all registrants. We're going to email you in a few days as well after that video is available so that you'll have this, you can share it easily. So you'll be taken care of. All right, so this is a good place to uh, end. I know it's, oh, it's, it's after 9 p.m. in Jerusalem, right? So it's past your bedtime. That's right. <laughs> and so um, 
I know you like to go to sleep early. So anyway, thank you again, Cassandra, um, Nurit, my dear sister. Uh, it's been great to listen to all three of you speak. I do have a feeling people are going to ask for maybe a second session like this. And so uh, we'll be talking to you, I'm sure, soon about moving this uh, conversation forward and doing another panel either like this or maybe uh, in uh, a different angle. Uh, but again, I can't thank you enough for your time, for your expertise, for caring, for your willingness to uh, be part of this. And um, it's going to be available, like Jamil said, so feel free to use it, send it to whoever you want, uh, do whatever you feel um, is, is, is useful to you. All right, so again, thank you and stay safe. Bye-bye. I've just Bye. seen a uh, hi from uh, Warsaw, a colleague from University of Warsaw said thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. And Nancy Stern.